In our headlines at this hour, North Korea fired a projectile on this Wednesday, according to South Korean officials, to mark what appears to be its 14th missile test this year. Russia's Vladimir Putin says the West must halt its supply of weapons to Ukraine. The remarks came during telephone talks with French President Emmanuel Macron. South Korea's Unification Ministry has disclosed early records of inter-Korean dialogue, which ultimately set the stage for high-level exchanges years later. Thank you for tuning in. It's Wednesday afternoon, May 4th, here in Capitals Hall, and you're watching The Daily Report. We start with news here on the Korean Peninsula. About two hours ago, North Korea fired a ballistic missile. Now, this latest launch marks Pyongyang's 14th missile test this year. For more, I have our Defence Ministry correspondent, Pei Eunji, live on the line. Eunji, what do we know thus far? Well, Sunny, at about 12 p.m., South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff announced in a text message to reporters that North Korea fired a ballistic missile toward the East Sea from the Sunan area of Pyongyang City. That's the same place that the North, North on March 24th conducted its full, first full ICBM test since 2017. The military said it's closely monitoring the situation to be ready for any additional launches. But it has not yet given further information on specific details, including the type of missile or how far or how fast it flew. Today's launch comes a little more than two weeks after the North launched new tactical guided weapons on April 16th. It's also the North's first launch of a ballistic missile since leader Kim Jong-un warned in a speech during a military parade last week that the regime could preemptively use nuclear weapons if threatened. That's all I have for now this hour, but I'll be back with more updates in a later newscast. Back to you, Sunny. All right, NJ, thank you for that report. That was our Pei Unji reporting from the Defense Ministry on North Korea's latest missile test on this Wednesday. On the local pandemic front, authorities have noted a slight decline in the daily tally with a total of 49,064 COVID-19 infections reported on this Wednesday. There have been 72 losses of lives and the number of critical cases stands at 432. At present, there is no patient waiting for a hospital bed. Also, in terms of local infections, the seven-day average is below 45,000. Meanwhile, from June, Jeju International Airport and Yangyang International Airport will resume visa-free entry to visitors from selected countries. Waivers had been stopped amid the pandemic. In the political arena, parliamentary confirmation hearings for the new cabinet nominees continue. Scheduled for this Wednesday are the hearings for Defence Minister nominee Lee jong Sop, Labour Minister nominee Lee jong Shik, as well as Oceans and Fisheries Minister nominee Cho seung hwan The hearing for Defence for Justice Minister nominee Han dong hun initially slated for today, has been postponed to next Monday with the ruling Democratic Party citing his failure to hand in essential information. So far, lawmakers have adopted confirmation hearing reports for three nominees, including Deputy Prime Minister Chu Kyung Ho. The hearing for Health Minister nominee Cho, Chung Ho Young ended abruptly Tuesday following clashes over his explanations with regard to allegations surrounding him and his family. Prime Minister nominee Han Dok Su, the only one who requires parliamentary approval, ended his hearing on Tuesday. Also on the local political front, President Moon Jae-in has officially declared into law a pair of controversial bills that essentially paved the path to eliminating the prosecution's power to investigate our Lee kyung reports. President Moon Jae-in, during his last cabinet meeting before leaving office, formally declared two controversial laws aimed at removing the prosecution's power to investigate, despite a petition from the People Power Party and the prosecution. 이와 같은 노력과 성과에도 불구하고 검찰 수사의 정치적 중립성과 공정성, 선택적 정의에 대한 우려가 여전히 회소되지 않았고 국민의 신뢰를 얻기에 충분하지 않다는 평가가 있었습니다. 국회가 수사와 기소의 분리에 한 걸음 더 나아간 이유라고 생각합니다. The official signing came on the same day as the second and final bill was passed, which removes the prosecution's ability to use evidence in one case to get testimony in another. Despite a boycott by the PPP, the ruling Democratic Party, which holds a majority in parliament, swiftly pushed the bill through. The other bill, which dramatically reduces the types of crimes the prosecution can investigate, was passed on Saturday, also led by the DP. 
the People Power Party had tried to block both bills by filibustering. But debate was stopped because the DP had passed motions in advance to ensure the sessions ended. Following the passage, the DP, which has been pushing for prosecution reform for years, said it was a historic day and it vowed to start the process of setting up a special investigative body, which would take over the prosecution's power to investigate. The PPP, which opposes the idea and the whole passage itself, condemned it as an unlawful legislative dictatorship by the DP. Now, the PPP will seek ways to block the law from actually taking effect during a four-month grace period. It fought for an injunction at the Constitutional Court, which has begun reviewing the case. The prosecution service expressed deep regret over the promulgation, saying the law itself and the passage procedure were unconstitutional, and they will take all possible responses, including taking the case to the Constitutional Court. Lee kyung Arirang News. Meanwhile, come next Tuesday, upon the launch of the unit administration, the tax burden on multiple homeowners who choose to sell their property will be eased for one year. Our Om Jiang explains. Starting next Tuesday, for one year, South Korea is to ease its hefty property capital gains taxes for multiple homeowners. It was originally planned to be imposed next Wednesday, but it was brought forward one day to the first day that President-elect Yoon suk yeol takes office. In a bid to rein in runaway housing prices, the government last June imposed a heavier tax on those who own two or more homes in some designated areas. Currently, when selling a house, multiple homeowners have to pay taxes of up to 75 percent of the capital gains from the property sale. With the revision, that'll be reduced to 45 percent of the capital gains. Temporarily relaxing the capital gains tax burden for multiple homeowners is a revision of the ordinance to the income tax law, so the incoming government can implement the measure without the National Assembly's approval. An expert says the revision will see more properties put onto the market. More properties are to come onto the housing market, but rather than those with high values of owning for them for the long term, it will be focused mostly on those on the outskirts of the capital. Also, the transition team pledged to ease mortgage rules for the first-time home buyers. The team announced on Tuesday they would raise the ceiling of the loan-to-value ratio by up to 80 percent for those people who are buying their first home. For those who own one property, the incoming government is to unify the loan-to-value ratio to 70 percent regardless of the region. Om ji Arirang News. In other news, early records of inter-Korean dialogue from the 1970s have been disclosed to the public and they show the shaping of high-level talks in the years after. Our Unification Ministry correspondent Han song woo has more. Archives of early inter-Korean dialogue from the 1970s have been unveiled to the public for the very first time. South Korea's Ministry of Unification on Wednesday disclosed a total of 1,652 pages of documents from the inter-Korean talks conducted from August 1970 to August 1972. They feature the first point of contact between South and North Korean Red Cross delegates since the peninsula was divided, along with 25 rounds of preliminary talks. We can say that if it weren't for the Red Cross talks, there would never have been full-fledged government-level talks between South and North Korea, led by the South-North Coordinating Committee. So the disclosure is significant in the sense that those same talks evolved into what we now refer to as inter-Korean dialogue today. Around a quarter of the records are censored, but they still include the agreement to establish an inter-Korean hotline and also working-level meetings on agenda drafts and procedures, which would shape the way reunions of separated families would take place decades later. The records can be accessed by visiting the archives reference room of the Office of Inter-Korean Dialogue, the National Institute for Unification Center, and the Information Center on North Korea, located in Seoul.
Their disclosure is a tad overdue, but the papers in their own way still hold both academic and educational meaning. I'm hoping they will serve as a catalyst so that more and more dialogue records between the two Koreas are made available to the public down the road. And that's exactly what the Unification Ministry is aiming to do. With Wednesday's trial disclosure, the ministry says it plans to make archives of inter-Korean talks more accessible to the public in accordance with regulations. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. South Korea's Paju City, which borders North Korea, will resume tours of the demilitarized zone after a two-year suspension due to COVID-19. Starting today, the city will open the Third Tunnel and the Torasan Observatory to 40 people per tour with other sites to follow. There will be six sessions on weekdays, except for Mondays, and 12 sessions per day of the weekends. The third tunnel, discovered in 1978 by South Korea, measures more than 1,600 meters in length and is estimated to be big enough for 30,000 North Korean soldiers to pass through in one hour. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called on Western leaders to halt their shipments of weapons to Ukraine. The remarks were made during talks with French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday over the phone. Our Kim Yosan has the latest. In a phone call with French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday local time, Russian President Vladimir Putin appealed to the West to stop supplying weapons to Ukraine. According to the Kremlin, Putin also urged the West to put pressure on Ukraine to halt the ongoing atrocities. The Russian leader told his French counterpart that Moscow is still open to dialogue. Macron, for his part, according to the Kremlin, explained that global food security was under threat due to the Ukraine war. He also called on the Russian leader to allow evacuations from the Azovstal steel plant in the city of Mariupol to resume. Macron is one of the few Western leaders to speak to Putin since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Against his backdrop, Russia began a renewed attack on the Mariupol steel plant shortly after the first group of civilians was evacuated from the facility. Russia explained it was using artillery and aircraft to target firing positions taken by Ukrainian troops. This comes as the mayor of Mariupol estimated over 200 civilians remain trapped underground with about 100,000 civilians in the city. The Ukrainian military high command said Russia is calling in troops based in its far east to join the battle. According to the Center for Defense Strategies, a Ukrainian think tank, the Kremlin was concentrating its recruitment on the far east and Siberia to sustain the war in Ukraine. Kim Yosan, Arirang News. And global wheat supplies are being severely threatened by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The two countries are the top producers, with sanctions against Kremlin and warfare in Ukraine are hampering proper distribution. Our Kim Doyan reports. With no end to the war in Ukraine in sight, countries are moving fast to either secure wheat supplies or gain global market share for their crops, as Ukraine's production is hit hard. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, around 50 countries import 30% of their wheat from either Russia or Ukraine, with some countries importing up to 60%. According to the Wall Street Journal, Russia, despite sanctions, has been able to export its wheat to some countries, and while Ukraine has struggled to bring its crops to market, Russia has gained ground. Citing AgFlow, a Switzerland-based crop data firm, the paper said Egypt's wheat imports from Russia grew 580 percent in March from a year ago, adding exports to Iran, Turkey and Libya all more than doubled. Other countries are also increasing their market share with countries trying to gain new supply lines. Exports from other grain-producing countries on the Black Sea, such as Bulgaria and Romania, also grew in March, according to the firm, with wheat shipments from South American countries including Brazil and Argentina more than doubling, while those from Australia rose nearly 75 percent. Governments around the world are working to make up for lost grain supplies. In March, Ireland 
launched a nearly 11 million U.S. dollars program to encourage farmers to grow more crops such as wheat, oats, and barley, hoping to reduce that country's dependence on imported grain. The Biden administration last week asked Congress for 500 million U.S. dollars to help boost U.S. crop production in an effort to make up for global shortfalls. However, the Wall Street Journal reported that with the amount of production that Ukraine was responsible for, along with massive acreage usually utilized, it will be impossible to make up the shortage despite global efforts. Kim Do-hyun, Arirang News. South Korean businesses related to cryptocurrency, batteries and K-pop are new additions to the list of top 500 companies with the highest turnover in the year 2021. According to data released by Seoul-based corporate evaluation website CEO Score on Wednesday, Samsung Electronics topped the list followed by Hyundai Motors and POSCO Holdings. With major companies posting high market caps last year, 52 businesses with over 1 trillion won or more than 790 million US dollars of revenue failed to make the list. Companies selling petroleum products were also named on the top tier of the list, largely driven by a recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And the country's second largest car maker, Kia, says it has registered its 10 millionth sale in the U.S. since deliveries to buyers there began in the year 1993. According to Kia America, the milestone comes as the company experiences a jump in sales of its electrified vehicles in spite of challenges facing the industry as a whole. Saying that it has sold more than 59,000 units in April, the company added it has achieved its best ever April total sales of EV models. Meanwhile, Kia's bigger affiliate Hyundai Motor reported its second best April retail sales month in its history in the U.S., reporting retail sales of nearly 62,000 units. Earlier on Tuesday, the Presidential Transition Committee unveiled an ambitious blueprint of 110 national tasks to be accomplished by the incoming Yoon suk yeol administration during its five-year term in office starting on May 10th. On Viewpoint today, we delve into some of those tasks, and for that purpose, I have Professor Kim hyun from the Korean National Diplomatic Academy here in the studio. Professor Kim, it's good to have you back. Thank you. I also have Professor Yang Hee-dong from Iwo Women's University. Professor Yang, it's been a while. Welcome back. Thank you. Right, now before we delve into our discussion today, let's first take a look at this related report by my colleague Yoon Jung-min. The Presidential Transition Committee has unveiled the incoming Yoon suk yeol government's policy goals, which include six policy directions and 110 specific tasks under a vision of taking another leap forward, prospering together. Chairman Antersu said Tuesday that the new government will put individuals first rather than the nation and emphasize the national interest, practical policies, fairness and common sense. In the current zeitgeist, governments are focusing on individual happiness and enabling people to live well together rather than a collective way of thinking that prioritizes the country as a whole. Broader goals focus on fairness, reviving the economy, strengthening welfare, nurturing science and technology, contributing to peace and inter-Korean relations, and expanding local autonomy. The incoming government has pledged full compensation for small business owners hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. It also plans to scrap the current government's policy of phasing out nuclear power and plans to reform both the justice system and the national pension system. On housing policy, it aims to provide some 2.5 million more homes to stabilize the market. The Transition Committee emphasized economic growth led by the private sector and supported by the government, aiming for deregulation and financial and tax incentives. The new government also plans to provide more support for new technologies, including semiconductors, AI and batteries, to increase the amount of semiconductor exports by more than 30 percent until 2027. It aims for the denuclearization of North Korea and normalizing inter-Korean relations while using AI technology to reinforce South Korea's military power. The initiative unveiled on Tuesday did not include deploying additional units of the U.S. anti-missile system thought. 
We continue to take a reserved stance on this. You can look at it that way. At this point, even the existing thought system is not working properly. Other tasks include reinforcing social welfare, nurturing key culture and narrowing the gap between the capital and other regions for balanced growth. The committee said its policy goals overall will require additional budget spending worth some 165 billion U.S. dollars over the span of five years. Since the presidential election in March, the Transition Committee has been working with experts in a range of fields to establish the UN administration's policy goals. The new government takes office next week. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Right, that was our Yoon Jung-min reporting on the national tasks to be tackled by the new administration. And as I mentioned earlier on Viewpoint Today, we delve into the tasks related to foreign policy and economic stability. Now, Professor Kim, under the goal of building a country that promotes, that contributes, that is, to global peace and prosperity, is the task of seeking a complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. What are your prospects on this particular plan? Well, during the Moon Jae-in government, the term was uh, called as complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The word verification was not there because, uh, you know, verification is very keen and sensitive to North Korean government. Uh, inspectors have to go into North Korean territory to check out whether the denuclearization process has been, you know, clearly, uh, you know, implemented with a reversible method. Uh, which, from the North Korean perspective, it's a uh, violation of North Korean sovereignty. Um, and also, I think uh, uh, Yoon Suk yeol government will call it as denuclearization of North Korea rather than the Korean Peninsula. Um, so I think uh, for now, this process uh, doesn't look very rosy during the government. Uh, of course, it was not very positive even during the Moon Jae-in government. Um, so I think, uh, you know, but, but nevertheless, uh, the U.S. and South Korea uh, cannot uh, just dump this idea and, and admit North Korea as a nuclear state. That is something that's contrary to uh, two countries' uh, you know, posture and policies towards North Korea. So I think uh, the, the policy itself will be stay there, but I think uh, more uh, realistic policy will be how to deter North Korea. Uh, how to uh, more effectively sanction North Korea, things like that. Right. Professor Yang, on the economic front, the transition team has spoken about uh, an economy led by the people and backed by the government. How do you interpret these words? Well, this is typical posture of liberal economists, such as Frederick, you know, the Hayek or the Milton Friedman. So, and the, this statement clearly differentiate this government from the Moon Jae-in's government because Moon Jae-in's government has put the emphasis on the government-driven uh, the employment and government-driven the uh, you know the uh, trigger for the economic growth. But now the posture and standpoint is absolutely reversed. So the major initiative comes from the civilian sector, private sectors, whereas the government take over uh, this abortion role. For example. The government, I mean, this uh, transition, the committee has declared that uh, the new government will launch a lot of taxation and financial support for new industries such as AI, batteries, whatever. And also they come up with all the uh, dissolving the uh, regulations, launching by, you know, the regulation uh, innovation strategy committee, whatever. And uh, so they also want to uh, facilitate investment from overseas or inside. So, for example, I mean, they can change the rates of tax over the investment on startups. And also if any companies, you know, uh, reshore back to this country, and then that company will also get benefit a lot of uh, tax, you know, the uh, reduction, etc. So the first station for the investment is one of the uh, critical issue uh, for the new economy and government has prepared a lot of uh, taxation and financial support right, to realize all these plans. And another key issue is they want to support the realization of very solid and stable supply chain, uh, supply chains. Because you know, think about the war between Ukraine and Russia, and you never expected that you know such abrupt, you know, the tension could occur in anywhere in, in, in overseas, and such an unexpected problems may cause great, critical damage in our overall supply chains. There's another concern that our government has to uh, prepare for.
It really is a concern. Yeah. Professor Kim, the head of the Transition uh, Committee, Anshul Su, also announced plans to strengthen uh, Korea's, South Korea's capability to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. But he made no mention of the possible additional deployment of U.S. missile defense systems, namely the THAAD, which was something that uh, the president-elect had touched upon. What are your thoughts? I think uh, additional THAAD deployment is a very keen issue for the, any government of South Korea. Uh, but, but I think first we have to deal with uh, the THAAD operation that has been already deployed in South Korean territory. Uh, that's, I think, the first thing we have to deal with because, um, you know, uh, the Moon Jae-in government and Chinese government uh, reportedly uh, have agreed or, you know, Moon Jae-in government expressed its positions towards China that you know, three no's and, and one uh, limitations. And one limitation means that the already deployed THAAD uh, equipment should not be normally operated. So I think that's the first uh, homework for Yun Song Yeol government, which I think will bring uh, a, another, you know, repercussion from the Chinese government. Um, and also THAAD uh, deployment again, extra THAAD deployment, I think that's something that is right on the red line of Chinese government. Uh, Chinese uh, government and experts uh, continuously express that the red line for, South, for China is uh, military issues uh, that can threaten the, um, you know, the, the core interests of China. So things like that, THAAD issues and also, if South Korea comes up with uh, Japan and the United States to form a uh, military trilateral military alliance system, that will be another threat to China. So, um, usually when these, these issues touch upon the red line of Chinese government, that brings a, another you know, economic coercion by China to South Korea. So, are we ready for that? Are we ready to deal with Chinese economic coercion? Uh, maybe not. Takes a, takes a long term, uh, you know, implementation. So I think uh, that issues uh, that can bring the Chinese economic coercion on South Korea, that will be a burden to the Yoon Sang-yeol government. Right, I see. Yeah. Professor Yang, according to calculations by the transition team, an additional 209 trillion won over the next five years will be needed to address the 110 national tasks. Now, Ms. Tan has spoken about raising the money through restructuring national spending and through taxes. How feasible is this funding plan? Well, that many people have developed concerns over this very uh, ungrounded, rosy in estimations and predictions because, you know, every government has declared they need extra money. For example, the uh, Park Geun-hye government declared they need about $135 billion and even Moon Jae-in government declared that they need another $178 billion. Every new government has you know, asked for the extra budget to realize their new plans and new government divisions. Same for this government. But the problem is how would you raise this money? Well, the, compared to the early period, the government such as Park geun -hye and Moon Jae-in who prepared very thoroughly for their budget and expense plans, but this transition committee is pretty some kind of short and unprepared compared to the uh, previous you know, transition uh, the committees. For example, they declared that they needed $209 billion for the next five years. That means about $40 billion per year. And, uh, you know, the Mr. Ahn has declared that they can reduce the tax expenses by $20 billion, increase the tax income by $20 million. But the problem is for the past three years, our tax income has been very stable, around $295 billion. Last year was pretty exceptional because we had, you know, earned about extra about 55 or $58 billion due to, uh, you know, abrupt in the increase of the, uh, and the, uh, it, the uh, real estate market and also the uh, stock markets. But that was very, very peculiar and idiosyncratic the, uh, phenomena because you know, the government could earn the extra the, uh, transfer income tax. And, uh, you know, but uh, that is very, very unrealizable for this year. As you see already, you know, our stock prices have been pretty uh, you know, sluggish this year. Another problem is, you know, the, I'm not sure whether we, that this new government can reduce the expense by $20 billion because for the past years, our government has tried to renovate their you know, government expenses. But in average, the $10 billion used to be the maximum amount of their reduction. So unless they come up with a very detailed third sort of plans, how they raise their you know, extra budget or how they reduce the expenses, I mean, this uh, ungrounded plan is very, very, you know, uh, 
unrealizable and cause a lot of concerns. Right, so I suppose only time will tell then. Right, let's see what happens. Professor Kim, beyond the Korean Peninsula and keeping in mind the dramatic shift in international order amid Russia's warfare in Ukraine, how can the new government here perhaps play a more tangible role in promoting the peace and prosperity that it seeks, it hopes to do so within its five years in office? I mean, I mean, there are always a lot of ways to to contribute to promoting peace and prosperity in global community. Um, the important thing is, can we do it, or, or is South Korea willing to do it? Because uh, South Korean, uh, you know, national, you know, capability is, uh, you know, in in economic terms, GDP terms is, uh, you know, number ten in the world, and uh, of course, geographically, we are, you know, around the big powers. Uh, right next to China under the very severe U.S.-China competition. Maybe South Korea can think of itself as a, still a weak country compared to those uh, you know, big countries com you know, competing each other. But I think uh, on, on other important issues uh, like global issues uh, that are dealing with uh, you know, some significant values and interests, I think South Korea has to you now you know, speak out uh, for the, for the you know, international community. And that has been... Uh, something that has not been, you know, uh, you know, taken as the prop proper uh, position for South Korea for many years. Um, the, I think, a motto for the Yoon suk yeol government's foreign policy is to make South Korea as a global pivotal state, uh, which means that we have to speak and, and behave uh, when we need to do that. So I think, uh, you know, at least speaking out about what is wrong about Russia and other countries, that's something, you know, that needs to be done by, by South Korea from now on. Right, so there is great room for improvement on that in that particular arena then. And speaking about economic prosperity then, Professor Yang, the focus also appears to be on green growth. Now, as pledged during his campaign rallies, President-elect Yoon suk yeol will resume nuclear energy campaign here in the country and uh, plans are to export 10 nuclear reactors by the year 2030. What do you believe would be the broader implications of this particular initiative on the local economy? Well, humongous, because... You know, I read a very interesting article about the impact of uh, nuclear the energy on the overall industry. And the report says that the uh, nuclear power has very great, great, the greatest value as compared to other sources of energy, such as you know, uh, uh, renewable energies or the, you know, the carbon energies. But the problem is the image of the carbon, the, uh, you know, the uh, energies has become so bad, I mean, in the last government. It's like the image of the automobiles. The automobile used to maintain the image of a uh, symbol as the liberty, but now the automobile has become the symbol of environment damages. So, I mean, I think this government needs to take care of the parallel approach to take care of both of uh, nuclear power generations and also renewable energies, because renewable energies is, cannot be ignored. I mean, you may have heard about the all 100 that, that means the, you know, big large companies need to, uh, you know, uh, acquire their energy sources from the renewable energy by 100% by 2050. Well, that is the voluntary campaign launched by some, you know, the uh, private sectors. But unless the large companies have uh, come to realize that the vision is really, really tough for them to export their products or to, uh, you know, increase their or the, uh, you know, customize their or the uh, cosmetic, their images to the public. That's a big, big concern for the company, uh, for the companies. But uh, in the public sector, again, nuclear power generation has taken about 30% in our power generations uh, as of 2016. And the ratio has pulled me down about 23% in the 2018. But it came back up to 30%. And a couple of years ago. So that means even the Moon Jae-in government has approved at the minute that, that they cannot help depending on nuclear power to take care of all the power consumption in this you know, peninsula. So and my point is, well, uh, you know, President-elect Yoon is very, very correct and very brilliant to take care of both approaches, you know, for both of uh, the nuclear and also, but uh, my point is we cannot ignore the importance of uh, renewable energies and new energies such as hydrogen. Right, we can't. Right. Professor Kim, moving forward, on the diplomatic front, if all goes according to plan, President-elect Yoon suk yeol will meet with his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden less than two weeks entering mm. office because the meeting is planned for May 21st. What look to be the implications of this upcoming summit as South Korea hopes to play a greater role in the international arena? Um, 
it seems like uh, you know many diplomatic policies resemble what has been uh, under the Lee Myung Bak, you know, <laughs> government at that time. The the slogan was Global Korea. Uh, I hope that is not exactly the same. Uh, but I think a major two issues are there about, about the summit meeting. First one is uh, how can two countries, uh, you know, coalesce with each other on North Korea policies. Um, the problem for Moon Jae-in government's North Korea policy and its, its coordination with the United States was that uh, they could not agree about the, the threat perceptions. I mean, Moon Jae-in government was thinking of North Korea as more as a partner to deal with, to, to have a dialogue with. Um, but uh, Joe, Joe Biden and, and the United States uh, per se was thinking that uh, U.S.-South Korea alliance has to be you know, targeting more of a China, about the China issues rather than North Korea issues. So two countries were thinking differently about North Korea and China altogether. Um, of course, uh, they come up with the, the policy coordinations and, and they came up with the, the uh, you know, similar uh, policies towards North Korea, but that didn't long, you know, continue very long. So I think that's the first issues. Uh, you know, are we ready to coordinate with the United States about China issues and, and how long we are going to do that? Uh, and how about, how about the uh, North Korea issues? Uh, you know, the Yoon suk government is thinking that the North Korea policy and North-South relations should be normalized, which means that denuclearization should be implemented and progressed so that the relationship will develop into the future. Um, and how can we coordinate these kinds of policy platform with the Joe Biden's thinking about North Korea? That's the first one. And, and about the uh, China issues, um, many tricky issues are there. Uh, uh, the U.S. Is, is hopes that uh, South Korea become a full-fledged member for its Indo-Pacific strategies. Of course, it doesn't mean that we can easily become a member of Quad, but uh, how can we become a member for the Indo-Pacific strategies? I mean, uh, are we willing to go out to uh, Taiwan Strait if there is any kinds of conflict there to fight a war? Uh, for the uh, um, you know United States side, that kind of issue is something we have to coordinate with the United States. Right, a lot of thought will be necessary then, mm -hmm. Professor Yang. The incoming administration will offer cash-based welfare support to families with toddlers 11 months and younger. Now these families will receive about 700,000 won starting uh, a month. That is starting next year, which will be raised to about a million and a million won per month in, by the year 2024. Do you see effort as countering the low birth rate, which ultimately, as you mentioned? mentioned quite a while back when we were talking about hampering economic stability if you have a low birth rate. Will it tackle the issue of our low birth rate here in the country? Right, the, that, uh, the major purpose of that uh, you know, financial support for particularly young married couples, absolutely, you know, the target is at increasing the birth rate. But the problem is this policy is too short-sighted because take a look at the lifetime you know, span of your new kids. I mean, it's not just a matter of the first five years or first, you know, the one year, you know, to raise, I mean, to give the, the great the quality of life and to give good raising for your kids. So, I mean, absolutely, there are lots of the issues to result in the private sector or by families per se. But I think this is like, a, you know, a very small tip over the iceberg. So it may help to uh, increase them, um, you know, uh, resolve the problems of pregnancy and help some you know, young uh, poor families, particularly to raise their uh, small kids. But I don't think that this is enough to increase our birth rate. I mean, a good example is think about the famous economist Mathis. I mean, about 200 years ago, he estimated, he predicted that every congested city will suffer from a low birth rate. I mean, even this phenomenon is very archaic. And before, you know, 200 years ago, why? Because most of the citizens in living those congested, you know, cities do care about their own survival. It's really tough to survive in this congested city. So in other words, the house prices involved, living quality, career development, all there are so many diverse issues in the, involved with the, uh, the low birth rate. So I don't think that there is one, you know, omnipowered solution to resolve all these issues. So I think this plan may help in somehow, but it cannot be the cure all of this a fundamental in a care of this uh, low birth rate problem. But for the moment, we'll keep our fingers crossed then. Right, right. All right, right. Professor Yang, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts and your time. And Professor Kim, thank you very much for your insight today. Thank you. Thank you.
Korea's southern resort island of Jeju is playing host to an electric vehicle exposition aimed at easing our carbon footprints. Arirang's Kim Yun Sung was there. Jeju Island is known for its harmony with nature. Here on Tuesday, innovators gather to display some of their brightest ideas for a green, sustainable future. For the 9th International Electric Vehicle Expo, electric vehicle families from 50 different countries have come to this carbon-free island of Jeju-do to put their heads together about the future and find solutions to climate change. This year, we have around 100 sections displaying ESG firms, electric ships, UAM and autonomous cars. From new and upgraded electric vehicles to compact and convenient chargers, this expo has it all. It's been about 200 years since electric vehicles were invented, but there are a lot of reasons why they haven't been popularized. They don't go far, they're expensive. But here we are rewriting the 200-year-old history of electric vehicles. Visitors can even get a chance to get behind the wheel, like testing out this South Korean electric car called Maeve. This small electric car can serve as an excellent energy solution. It comes with a 600-liter trunk and can go up to 100 kilometers after one full charge. Small electric vehicles are typically not allowed to drive on highways or major roads. But this car could replace motorbikes to make short-distance deliveries. It's safer, it packs more, and most importantly, it's greener. One report from the National Institute of Environmental Research says that the carbon monoxide emitted by motorbikes make up about a third of traffic pollution. With this car running on roads instead, the carbon emissions from food deliveries can be cut down to zero. Another technology from a South Korea-based company caught visitors' attention. We develop full-stack autonomous driving software. Our total autonomous driving distance is the world's seventh longest. And we're constantly improving by putting our technology to the test on roads so we can put it out on the market soon. Their self-driving vehicle uses light detection and ranging sensors to detect its surrounding. The company's technology also includes remote control. This might seem like a driving simulation, but it's actually driving a car in Hwasong, more than 500 kilometers away. Now they're looking to go one step further and turn their cars electric. The International Electric Vehicle Expo is open until this Friday. Kim Yun-sung, Arirang News, Jeju Island. Prevention, people say, is better than cure, and that is precisely what a group of researchers here are hoping to do with regard to possible gas leaks at industrial plants. Here's Cho Sang-min. A group of South Korean researchers have developed a type of technology that can detect gas leaks at industrial compounds. Composed of multiple layers of nanofibers, the small metallic sheet changes color to black once it enters a glass container full of hydrochloric acid. This time, the white sheet turned yellow when exposed to a different type of gas. According to the developers, the sheets are coated with special nanofibers highly reactive to specific gases. We developed this sensor by integrating color-changing pigments to a nanofiber sheet at Thena, say, 200th of a hair strand. With the relatively large area that the fibers can cover, they can detect even a small amount of gas. The sensors also consist of key materials used to prevent gas leaks at semiconductor and display plants. For the most optimal results, a set of sensors must be installed on each gas pipe with each serving different purposes. The first sensor would monitor the fiber's color every 10 seconds, while the other would reassess the status of the gas and send the signal to the central monitoring system once it detects a leak. When leaks occur, the sensors are designed to open up a valve to house the toxic gas inside an empty container, thus preventing any fatal accidents. Our color-sensing nanofiber is embedded inside a safety device that prevents gas leaks, which helps detect potential leaks in advance. As gas leak-related incidents have taken their toll on South Korean chip and display plants, the new fiber sensors are seen as a reliable safeguard that can reduce accidents moving forward. Cho Sung-min, Arirang News.
Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Both Greece and Italy have come forward with plans to reduce their reliance on Russian gas. On Tuesday, Greece officially started construction on a new floating liquefied natural gas terminal to improve gas supply to southeastern Europe and reduce dependency on Russian gas supplies. European leaders attended the ceremony at the construction site in the northeastern port city of Alexandropolis. The new LNG terminal station will store 153,500 cubic meters of LNG and turn 5.5 billion cubic meters of LNG back into gas each year. Meanwhile, Italy has set a goal of becoming completely independent from Russian gas by 2024. In an interview on Tuesday, Italian cabinet minister Roberto Cingulani said that it's necessary and expressed an interest in diversifying gas imports from Algeria, Angola, Congo and Qatar. These new measures come as the EU seeks to reduce its dependency on Russian gas following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On Tuesday, people across Japan protested the government's plan to amend its pacifist constitution. The demonstrations took place on Japan's Constitution Memorial Day. A rally in Tokyo was attended by 15,000 people, and other protests were also held in Osaka, Hokkaido and Hyogo Prefecture. Participants said that due to Japan's previous wars, the country shouldn't have an army. They also spoke out against the government's plan to increase military spending by around 38.4 billion US dollars. Meanwhile, a recent survey of 3,000 people by local Japanese outlet Yomiuri Shinbun found that 6 out of 10 respondents support the constitutional amendment. Inmates in overcrowded prisons in Bolivia are able to reduce their sentence by reading books. The initiative, which was first observed in Brazil, aims to expand literacy. Prisoners who take part in the Books Behind Bars program get the chance to be released from jail days or even weeks earlier. This comes as the country grapples with a slow judicial system that has left many in detention while awaiting trial. So far, the program has been launched in 47 prisons, which don't have financial resources for education or social assistance. According to reports, 865 inmates are currently improving their reading and writing skills while moving closer to freedom. New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art hosted the annual Met Gala on Monday evening. Celebrated as a big night out for fashion, celebrities are known to wear their most striking outfits for the red carpet. Featuring big names from TV, film and politics, they dressed according to their interpretation of this year's gilded glamour and white tie dress code. This references the Gilded Age, an area during which America transformed at the end of the 19th century through rapid economic growth. Also in attendance was Korean actress Jong ho Yeon, with fashion magazine Vogue exploring her look, which was reportedly inspired by late 1800s oil paintings. A new exhibition has been drawing in fans of the legendary martial arts master Bruce Lee. Starting on April 24th in San Francisco's Chinatown, the exhibit titled We Are Bruce Lee explores many aspects of the martial artist's life. In particular, it looks at Lee's popularity across socio-economic classes in the U.S., as he was particularly popular in underrepresented minority communities. The exhibition has interactive displays that get visitors involved and thinking about how Lee lived his life. One avid collector even loaned roughly 300 artifacts to the exhibition, including a document that showed Lee was paid less than actors in minor roles and the stuntman. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Wednesday afternoon. It's beautiful out there, sunny, bright and breezy. Just go outside and have fun. But don't forget to put on your sunscreen and wear sun protection gear as the UV index is high or very high across the country. Highs are hitting the upper 20s in most regions and because of early season high temperatures, actually I was sweating a little bit. What we are seeing is much higher than what is considered to be normal at this time of year. And in terms of wildfire risks, things couldn't be worse on the East Coast due to a combination of strong wind and dry weather advisories, which are likely to continue until tomorrow. So my suggestion is to not start a fire outside at all. But overall, tomorrow it's going to be a lovely day to go outside. Well, happy Children's Day. And there's a chance of patchy rain on Friday, and afterwards, it's going to be a bit cooler. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions.
Well, it's time to say goodbye. Do join us again same time tomorrow. Thank you for now.